All right, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, we're picking up on our series on the book of 1 Peter. And so if you've got your Bibles or you've got your devices, or if you'd like to look at the overhead, you're going to see the passage that we're dealing with on the overhead. It's um, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading at verse 4, and we're going to read through verse 10. So we're picking up on where we left off a couple of weeks ago. And we're going to read from this passage now. And this morning, what we're going to be dealing with basically is really addressing these three fundamental questions. And that is this. And they're really, really fundamental questions. Who are we as individual Christians and as a church? Just who are we? And who should we be? And finally, why are we here? Why Why do we exist as a local church? Why does any local church exist in this city or in this country or the world. Um, we're dealing with matters of identity and purpose, okay? So let's, uh, let's look at our passage because Peter addresses that beginning at chapter 4. So again, First Peter 2, beginning verse 4, as you come to him, and who's the him? Well, that's Jesus, who's called a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So, the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We're going to end our reading at that point. You know, um, over this past week, especially over the last couple of days, is... is, um, kind of immersed myself in this passage, I realized just how incredibly dense this portion of the scripture that we just read really is. I mean, it's just, it's very compact and there's a lot here. And there, there are so many phrases in this passage that really could be a sermon in and of themselves. So, so the challenge then for a pastor or a teacher is to basically take all of that content and kind of condense it in, 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 in kind of a simple way, in an understandable way, in an applicable way, and, and, and hopefully, by God's grace and spirit, I'm able to, to, to do that this morning, and God will give us his grace to understand what is, what is spoken. Another thing I want to draw your attention to at the outset is, and, and I will be drawing your attention to this this morning, um, it's very interesting here that what Peter is doing under the inspiration of the Spirit is he's drawing a lot of parallels, a lot of connecting points between the New Testament and the Old Testament, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what he's doing is he's drawing upon the Old Testament to give us an understanding of our identity and purpose. So bear that in mind as we go through the passage together. So very briefly, as a quick intro, I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine that you are in front of your... I don't know, you're, a lot of us have bathroom mirrors in our apartments or in our homes. And let's say you go into that bathroom and you look at yourself in the mirror. And I don't know if you've ever done this. But you look at yourself in the mirror and have you just ever really looked closely at yourself and asked these two fundamental questions? Just, who am I? <laughs> Who's this person I'm looking to in the mirror? And really, why am I here? Why do I exist? Why, why am I on this, this planet? You would think that a lot of individuals, let's say in their teens and 20s, as they're trying to kind of find themselves and their place in the world, would be doing that kind of thing. And yet, it's always very healthy for each and every one of us. I don't care if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or an older person. Always just to periodically ask yourself that very fundamental question. Just who am I at this stage of my life? And what is God calling me to do in this world? Why am I here? Why do I exist? 
And not only is that important for us to do as individuals, but for every local church, including Pathway, we need to ask ourselves the question, just who, we, who are we as a church, biblically speaking? Biblically speaking. And really, what is our purpose? What, what, why, why are we here? Why are we here in this pla- place? Why over the last couple of years has God put this church together? What is our purpose? Where are we going? And it's important for us to ask that question because it, 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 it keeps us, and especially keeps the leadership very focused and intentional about what they're doing and how they're leading the congregation and, and how we should be functioning as a church, as the body of Christ, not only among each other, but especially in this city. So we're going to be looking at that this morning, okay, especially the focus on well, indiv- us as individuals, but also as a church. So, um, without further ado, I want to draw your attention to the opening verses, verses 4 and 5, where Peter gets immediately into what we would call our identity, who we are as the body of Christ. And notice these words. As you come to him, that is Jesus, who is noted as a living stone. Now, we oftentimes don't think of a stone as you know, something living. We think of a stone as inanimate doesn't move it's just there but jesus christ is called a living stone i'll explain that a little bit later on because um the passage later on does speak about this so as you come to him a living stone rejected by men but in the sight of god chosen that is the word there electos elect and precious you yourselves now there's that term again like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to take a close look at, if you've got your Bible, look at your Bible. If you've got your device, look at your device, or otherwise look on the overhead. And I want you to look at the various images that Peter draws upon here. He talks about a spiritual house. He talks about living stones. He talks about uh, a priesthood. He talks about sacrifices that are offered by priests. So you see what he's doing here. Remember what I said before the sermon. There's a connection here that he's making all the time between the New Testament, Old Testament. And in this case, particularly between the church and the Old Testament temple. So if you and I want to understand who we are as a church, you've got to go back to the Old Testament. Begin there and then see its fulfillment, particularly the fulfillment of the Old Testament temple and the church all right now with that having been said i want to let you i want to alert you to this that the apostle paul not just peter but the apostle paul does the same thing in the book of ephesians so av would you put that uh passage on from the book of ephesians all right there we go ephesians 2 19 through 22 and i want you to notice the similarity between what peter says regarding the identity of pathway or any other church, and what the Apostle Paul writes here. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are members of God's household. Now, what he's saying there when he talks about aliens and strangers is that when he's talking about the Old Testament, you know that was for the Jewish people. So you had the Jews and you had the Gentiles. In the New Testament, what happens is the non-Jews, the Gentiles, are actually attached to the God's people. All right. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are members now of God's household. Now notice the imagery here. Built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now there's a lot of different images here. But again, notice the apostle Paul He's, he's identifying us in connection with Old Testament imagery, all right? Now, um, kids, I'm well aware of the fact that I can preach, and it's very easy, and I think if I was a little kid, too, I would kind of check out at some points because, well, there's just some things that are hard to understand. So for your sake, what I'm going to do is rather than ask you to use your imagination, I'm going to provide a quick visual for you. So why don't you go put that up there? Now, this is kind of dark here, and I knew it would be dark, but anyway, I think you can see it well enough. It's kind of a smaller picture, but kids, you take a look at that, right? That's, that's an old church building, and that's actually an old church building in the province of Ontario, and that church is simply called the Old Stone Church. 
Now, kids, I want you to take a look at it. It's hard to see, but that church, is it made out of brick? No, it's made out of stone. That's why they call it the old stone church, right? Notice all the little stones, and I don't know if you've ever seen a stone church before, but if you go to England or Scotland and in the British Isles, you see a lot of churches like that, some in Canada also. And you take a look at that, and you see that that church building is made up of all kinds of, as I said, not bricks or stones. Now, bricks are a lot of times the same size, same texture, same width, same length, and all of that, okay? But these are stones, and stones are all different. Stones are different sizes, different textures, different colors, and so on. And what the Apostle Paul kids is saying is that the people at Pathway in any local church, we're not bricks, we're not all the same, but we're stones. That means we're all different. We're different in terms of our backgrounds. We're different in terms sometimes of our color or our race or our culture or the different gifts that God has given us. We're all very different, just like stones in a building. And that's what makes the church so beautiful. There's a certain unity that we have in Christ, but there's a diversity. We're all different, but we're all, we all share the one faith in Jesus. We all share that one spirit. All right, moving on. So you see the stones there. But it's hard to really tell. But if you look at the bottom, especially on the left side, you have this long string of, of rock, and that's called the foundation. And the Apostle Paul says the foundation of every church is what? He said in Ephesians 2, it's the prophets and the apostles. In other words, he's saying the Old and the New Testament that is contained here in this book, this is the foundation of every solid church in Jesus Christ. All right? So... That's, our church is based upon this book, as every faithful church is. The Old and the New Testaments contained here. That's why the Bible says the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. Now, another thing. You can't see it, but it's probably behind that big tombstone there. But in the corner, you have what's usually the first stone that is laid, and that's called the cornerstone. And if you would go to many churches today, church buildings you will see that there's a big stone in the corner of the church, and they call it the cornerstone, right? The Bible says that Jesus is the cornerstone. And what I mean by that is when, when a person lays that cornerstone for the foundation, it's the first stone that is laid and is also one that provides direction for all the other stones of the building. That's who Jesus is. He's the living stone, the first stone, who as the head of the church provides direction for us as a church. Then one other thing. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says it's the Holy Spirit who lives in the church. He the word that's used there is dwells. He lives within us and he lives around us. And it's this spirit who not only blesses us together and grows us in our faith, but it is this very spirit, in the book of Acts we see this especially, that sends us out into the world to speak forth the word of Jesus to the nations of the world. And then it is the same spirit that, as the Bible goes out to the nations of the world, draws them in one by one as living stones that are added to the church. There's always additions to this church that is being built. Okay? You see that in that visual. This is a beautiful thing. Now, um, here's the thing. So we get to see the identity of the church as the ones who are not only be a blessing to each other, but a blessing to the world. And that's always the emphasis of Peter, that we're not here for ourselves, first and foremost. It's not about you and me. It's about the nations and God using us for the sake of the nations and for the sake of the city, okay? Now, following up on that, as the Spirit of God goes out into the world and as the message of Jesus is brought to the world, there's, there's different responses to that message. I mean, if you've ever shared your faith with someone, you know that to be true. Some love that message and some don't, right? So the message goes out and you have these different responses. And he, he if you could go back, A.V., to the First Peter passage for just a moment. And I'm going to start reading from verse 6. I want you to notice the responses here. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone. Now notice that word, a cornerstone. That's Jesus. Chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. 
Mm. All right. Let me simplify this. The word goes forth from the church, say from Pathway, out to those who are outside this building. And there are always those who are going to want to receive that word and be blessed by that word, and there's those who are going to find it rather offensive or those who are going to, find it, who are going to have a response at least of indifference. Who cares? Right? They don't bother me. Okay? Now, here, here's kind of a heavy thing I'm going to say. What Peter does in this passage is he roots those two responses of loving Jesus and hating him, of embracing him or just really being indifferent. He re roots those two responses in what we call the decree of God, the decision, the eternal decision of God to open the hearts of some and pass by and not open hearts of others. Okay? This is commonly known in theological circles, and I don't know if you've ever heard these two terms before, but election and reprobation. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go about explaining all of what that is about now, not because I'm afraid to, but because we're going to deal with that at a later time. It has to revolve around this whole heavy doctrine of predestination. Okay? We'll deal with that at a latter, latter time, because a lot of people have a lot of confusion about that doctrine. I'm not going to deal with it now because while it's here in this passage, it's not part of the main theme of this passage. Okay? But I want to demonstrate that. First of all, notice that Jesus Christ is the one who is chosen. That word is electos. He's elect. He's elected by God to be the Savior of the world. Okay? And then it talks about those who are then you and I as the elect, those who are chosen in Christ so that we might have the opportunity then to believe in Jesus Christ. So those who are chosen by God in Christ before the foundation of the world from all eternity, then by the grace of God, according to that decree, actually are drawn irresistibly, invincibly to Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful truth. And again, I want to fill it out at a later time. But I want you to notice something also here. It says, those who find Christ a rock of stumbling and a rock of offense. Notice verse 8, they stumble because they disobey the word. But that's not where it ends. It says, and to this, they were destined to do. Or literally, in the original language, they were pointed to that. This is a great mystery to us. And we have to, to be careful of probing the mystery beyond what the Bible reveals. But what you have is you have those, let me just put it this way, and, and simply on the basis of this passage, what you have in the end is you have two different types of people in the world, ultimately, as they respond to the word, as they respond to the gospel, okay? So um, even though, I mean, even if you look at Pathway, we have, we have different people of backgrounds, different histories, uh, different colors, different cultures, these kinds of things. Even though we're all really quite different, fundamentally, there's only really two types of people. Those who believe and those who don't. Those who embrace Christ, those who reject him. Those who love him, those who don't want to have anything to do with him. The church always faces this as it brings the gospel to bear in the world. Here's the question that the Bible deals with and that the book of 1 Peter deals with often, and that is this. What's supposed to be the relationship of those who are in Christ to those who are outside of Christ, to those who love Jesus and those who stumble over him? either because they find him offensive or they just have an indifferent attitude. What's supposed to be our relationship? Fundamentally, what's supposed to be the relationship between the church and the world? And you know, if you, if you go back in church history, it's kind of interesting. If you do a bit of study on this, what you see is that oftentimes the Christian's response in terms of their identity and purpose toward the world is this, this Christian response either falls, uh, it falls into the realm of either one or three, of three camps. The first camp is this, and we're talking about a relationship with the world. The first, relation, uh, the, the first camp is basically this, that there are those who, who kind of have an, uh, um, an us kind of versus them mentality. 
It's not like we're nasty to people in the world, but we just, we kind of, we're a little bit at arm's length. And it's not because we just think people are nasty and we're the best people in the world, but oftentimes what happens is that there is the fear and possibly the suspicion that if we get too close to the world, and especially when you're a young parent, and I get this, because Joy and I have four young kids at one point too, you, you want to guard them from the negative influences of the world. Don't forget what the Apostle Peter taught in um, Acts chapter 2. He, he refers to the world as a wicked and perverse generation. The Apostle John says the whole world is in the power of the evil one. So we, we well understand that. So what happens is that because we read that in the Bible, it's kind of like us versus them or us kind of against them because we want to remain a holy people. We want, we want to for the sake of our kids, provide them a godly witness, and that's what we should be doing. But sometimes what happens in a church, and oftentimes more one of emphases, what we do is we start, we kind of circle the wagons so that we end up really becoming somewhat irrelevant to the world because we're just taking care of our own. That's one emphasis, and it's easy to fall into that. The other is the opposite, where we're not separationists as much as we are what we call accommodationists. And sometimes you get in churches that are, that are all, and we, we talk a lot about this at Pathway. We're all about, you know, we want to reach the gospel. Uh, we want to reach the culture with the gospel. And we, we want to be missional. It's a big buzzword today. And sometimes churches that are so missional are always so much focused on what is the outside because they want to build bridges that actually what happens is you get too close to the fire and then you actually start getting burned and you start, you start losing some of the distinctives of your faith over time. And then you fall into compromise, and that's not a healthy thing either. So you see those two extremes. you got separationism, you got accommodationism, and then there's a third camp. And the third camp is not what we call the separationist camp or the accommodationist camp, but the infiltrationist camp. And that embraces the kind of balance that Peter has in this passage, where we're in the world, and we want to love the world, and be for the world, and for the benefit of the world, but at the same time, we're saying but we need to remain a holy people and a distinctive people. Do you see how difficult that is? Peter broaches that in the passage, and he never provides a perfect answer how we, going about, how we go about doing that. So Peter's teaching us we need to be in the world, for the world, but not ultimately of the world. A, a good phrase or a good two words to be used in regard to that is what we call faithful presence. We need to be faithfully present in the world. And when you think of those two words, then you automatically think about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was faithfully present in the world. He was present in the world. I mean, so much so that he took on human flesh, just like we and I, that you and I have, right? He takes on human flesh as the eternal son of God. How much more present can you get than that? He preaches in the world. He teaches in the world. He heals in the world, very present. And yet at the same time, always, he doesn't get too close to the fire, but always remains faithful to his heavenly Father's will for him. And what does the Bible say in regard to Jesus? For it's fitting that we have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners. Being faithfully present is not an easy thing. It's not easy to follow Jesus or the words of Peter in this whole book, right? But that's who we're called to be, a faithfully present people. I want to draw your attention to one quote from a man named James Davidson Hunter. Could you put that up there now, uh, A.V.? Take a look at this quote. He says, A theology of faithful presence is a theology of engagement in and with the world around us. It calls the church to bear witness to the shalom of God. That word shalom actually comes uh, in the Hebrew. It means to be health, a source of health and blessing and joy to the world. So he calls us to bear witness to the shalom of God where he has placed them. As Jeremiah 29, 7 says, Seek the welfare, the shalom of the city where you are in exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, the Hebrew is shalom, you will find your own welfare, your shalom. You think of the Israelites, and I'm going to get back to the passage in just a moment, but I want to explain this. When you think of the Israelites, remember when they were held captive in Babylon? That was a hostile culture. It had been very easy for God's people to do this with Babylon and to say, you know what, we're going to ride out the 70 years that we have here, and then we're done. We're out of here. They didn't do that. But neither 
neither did they do what they could have easily done, and that is accommodate to the culture and actually become like the Babylonians. God says, don't do that either. What God says is, I want you to be for the shalom of the city, and I want you to pray for it. Because when that culture finds its shalom and its blessing, that's where you're going to find your blessing as well. That's called faithful presence. One other quick thing. You know what? Michaela and, uh, or Micaiah and Layla and Parker and Jenna, and now to learn Renee, you know what they're doing when they go to the mission field, when they go to Mexico? or when they go to uh, Baja or the Baja Peninsula, Mexico, or if they go to um, Zambia, you know, Nicaragua, when they're going there, what they're doing is they're taking the faithful presence and witness of Pathway along with them as they minister to people with the gospel in word and deed, in the orphanages, and all of that. That is a demonstration of faithful presence, being present in the world, but at the same time, providing a contrast witness to say, this is how we function, and this is how we live as Christians. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Faithful presence. That's our calling, okay? Now, Peter, as we move on the passage, and I just want to look at verse 9 yet, what Peter does is, as he moves on in this passage, in verse 9, what he does is he closely links for us both identity and purpose in order to drive the point home. Take a look at verse 9, if you would. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Now, here's the purpose. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now, when you take a close look at verse 9, there's, so many, there's a number of phrases there. Again, each of them are a sermon in themselves, but let me simplify it. The Lord is saying, as regards your personal identity and mine, and our identity and purpose as a church, that we are a chosen, select, and set-apart people to be a kingdom of priests in this world. Now, maybe you're wondering, what in the world does that mean? Because when you and I think of priests, we either think of Old Testament priest or maybe the gentleman that I shared a wonderful conversation with a number of months ago when uh, flying from Chicago to Vancouver, sat next to a Roman Catholic priest, just had this very, very interesting conversation. When I think of priest, I think, you know, black, and you got the collar and everything. But in reality, we're all priests. Now, what do we mean by that? All right, kids, I want you to listen in one more time. I'm going to explain this really simply. And briefly, you know who a priest was in the Old Testament? He was a person who stood in the middle. You say, what do you mean by that? He stood in the middle between God and God's people. And as a priest, he was called to bring something of God to God's people and something of God's people to God. So to put it simply, he brought something of God to the people. What was that? It was the law because God gave the law for his people. And it was the calling of the priest to teach that law so that people could know who God was and how God wanted them to live. But he also brought something of the people to God. He brought the people's sacrifices for their sins to God. He prayed on behalf of the people, brought their prayers to God. You see how he's in the middle? Now, when you take a look at the Old Testament, the priests were a part of a special class of individuals set apart for this very purpose. But the interesting thing is, and you can read this in Exodus 19, in, in a general way, all of God's people were called to be priests in the Old Testament. You say, well, what, what were they supposed to do as priests? They were called to bring God to the, as middle people in the world, they were called to bring God to the nations of the world and speak of him to the nations of the world so that the nations of the world would be drawn to God. That was their task. In other words, they, the reason why they existed, their purpose was so that as a people, they might be a light to the nations. Now, here's the thing. When you examine the whole Old Testament and the trajectory, the progression of the Old Testament, what you see is time and time again, this is what the Israelites did. If you got the nations over here, they were like this. 
I mean, read the book of Jonah in that way, right? They, they, they stood with their backs to the, to the nations. God says, I, want, I, I, I formed you together to be a light to the nations. They said, no, no, we're not interested in that. And they, beca- they became very withdrawn, and they turned in on themselves. So you know what Jesus did when he came to this world? Jesus came in this world in part to form for himself a new community of priests, beginning with the 12 disciples and building on from there in drawing more and more people to the faith. So as the people of God, the church of God, as he's gathering that church, he's saying, now, I want you as a church to do what my Old Covenant, my Old Testament people refuse to do. I want you to be true priests as you bring my gospel to the world so that people might be drawn in and so that they might be added as stones to the New Testament temple. I don't know if you ever thought about that. But it's a whole tra- trajectory of the Bible. And again, it gets at our identity and purpose. So I, I, I leave you with this. Um, what does that look like? To bring God to the nations, to bring Jesus to the nations of the world, to bring Jesus to the city. And Peter addresses that. He says in the last half of verse 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and so on, so that, there's the purpose clause, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What does it mean to be a light to the nations? It means for you to, number one, say, you know what? This church is not, even though it's a blessing to me, it's not first and foremost about me. It's about others who God may be drawn in here and, and so that we may be a blessing to each other, right? So, so the... The, the, the beauty of that is the way that we do that, the way that we bring others in, is through our mouths, through the words that we speak, to declare the excellencies of him who, by his grace, has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now we're doing that in the lives of others. But also there's a practical dimension to this. Faithful presence means not only the words that we speak, but the witness that we give to others out in the world, but also those who come to us by showing them that, you know what, we're, we're different people, and in our differentness, there is beauty. Being a contrast people, what does that look like? One final one. A.V., if you could put that up there. All right, what does it mean to really provide a light to the nations? Whereby we are a community of self-sacrificial love in a world of self-absorption a community of compassion in a world of callous attitudes, a community of purity in a world of promiscuity, a community of life in a world hell-bent on dissolution and death. By the way, this is what it means to be a holy people. A community of simplicity in a world of material excess, a community of truth in a world of lies, a community of conviction in a world of spiritual confusion, and a community of hope in a world of despair. So, let me ask you this. If, if people come into the context of pathway, will they get that sense? Will they see this kind of community? Or when we go out into the world, will they see a contrast people who are faithfully present and who reflect in word and deed that we belong to Jesus? Will they, will they see that? Because you know what? Remember a number of times ago when we, uh, when we looked at the, I think it was the first per, uh, sermon on First Peter, and I was talking about Roman culture. And all the, the dirt and all the filth and all the sorrow and all the dissolution of the breakdown of that culture. Always remember this, and you guys read the news, I trust, to a certain extent. As you look at where our culture is going, and it used to be, it used to go like this. Now it's going like, eh, like this. And we're going, where is it all going to end up in the wash? It doesn't look pretty. You know what's happening with this? We are recreating Rome. We are recreating Peter's time. So that when we look at this book and what Peter says about being a faithful presence, that's not something that we just read and go, well, that doesn't really apply to us. You know, that just happened so many years ago. It exactly applies to us because it's exactly the kind of world and the kind of city that we're living in. So it makes what we're doing here and how we're living and how we're speaking all that much more important as we provide that light to the nation. So may it be that in our words and in our hearts and with our mouths 
and with our hands, we might be that kind of faithful presence in the world that people over time will find compelling and find beautiful, find attractive, so that they too can join what we experience as joy here, that they may share in that and be blessed with us. That's our identity. It's not an addendum to what we do, just a little attachment. That's it. it gets at the heart of our identity, and it gets at the heart of our purpose, as Peter teaches us here in this passage and in the rest of this book, which we're going to be exploring more in the weeks to come. Enough said. You know what? I, I know it was a lot here this morning, and it kind of went fast, but may the Lord help us to think about these things and further, as we look in the mirror, ask ourselves, just who are we and what is our purpose? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, um, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for this very relevant book for us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as the weeks go by, more and more of the teaching of First Peter might resonate within us to fully form in us and further refine in us our identity and our purpose. Lord, we do pray for that. Um, Lord, there are so many needs in the world. We think of Nicaragua, and we think of Mexico, and we think of Zambia that were mentioned this morning. And we think of Iran that we mentioned this morning. Oh, Lord, so many needs. Even needs in our own city that, that Jenny will be talking to us about in just a moment. Father, give us a heart for these things. And help us to be that kind of faithful presence in the world and in the city that you call us to be. God, grant that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.